Welcome to Insight. Today we are chatting with Paul Rice, President and CEO of Fairtrade USA. Paul was inspired to found Fairtrade in 1998 after serving for 11 years as development advisor to cooperative farmers in Nicaragua. Paul has been honored by the Ashoka Foundation, by the Klaus Schwab Foundation for Social Entrepreneurship, and by the Skoll Foundation for Social Entrepreneurship. Fairtrade USA is the leading third-party certifier of fair trade products in the United States. Instead of creating a dependency on aid, Fairtrade uses a market-based approach that empowers farmers to get a fair price for their harvest, helps workers create safe working conditions, provides a decent living, and guarantees the right to organize. Paul has generously agreed to share some of his experience with us, and I'd like to thank you, Paul, for joining us today. Thanks, Mark. So the power of marketing, the power of standards, the power of shifting consumer behavior, talk about that power and how you have exercised it in this particular case. So, you know, my, my experience in the field, working with farmers way up in the mountains in the middle of nowhere for over a decade, led me to believe that the traditional approaches to poverty and to environmental degradation in the developing world are ineffective and largely bankrupt. It's a top-down approach that's driven by aid. And if you go to the communities where so many of those projects are taking place, what you find is that we're not effectively developing the capacity of people in the community to, de to, to solve their own problems. Uh, and in particular, most aid does not help small family farmers in rural communities around the world um, plug into the international market in a more effective way. M more often than not, the, the growth of the global economy is leaving those communities behind. So middlemen and, actually are, are seize control of, of those markets, and that in and of itself leads, leaves the, the growers behind. Exactly, exactly. Most small family farmers that grow your coffee or your bananas or your sugar are, um, you know, they're off the grid. They don't have computers, they don't have electricity, they don't have a vehicle, so they sell their raw harvest, their raw commodity harvest at the farm gate to whatever middleman rolls up and says, you know, today's price is 10 cents a pound, take it or leave it. And they have no face. I don't, I don't know who they are. Right. I, I have no connection to them. That's right. So that speaks to a real market failure. Um, if you look at global supply chains through the lens of big companies uh, here in the United States that are increasingly looking to make their supply chains more sustainable mm -hmm. and also, quite frankly, to um, mitigate the reputational risk uh, posed by uh, the, the, the black curtain, if you will, that has separated most buyers from these developing communities. Because what do you, if you don't have visibility into the supply chain, how do you know that there's not uh, child labor in your supply chain? How do you know that there's not pesticide poisoning or rampant deforestation in your supply chain, right? So companies increasingly want to know what's going on in the factory and on the farm where their raw commodities are, are being sourced. The unintended consequence of that distance between myself and that farmer is that I could be investing in deforestation. I could be investing in, in child labor. I could be investing yeah. in, in the inappropriate spraying of pesticides right. uh, onto the land. And companies here increasingly, uh, not only do they want to know where products are coming from, but they want to strengthen supply chains, they want to shorten supply chains and, and take out unnecessary middlemen in the supply chain. They want to source direct and they want to know that the farmer is getting enough money to be able to produce high quality products, right? You know, if you're a Starbucks or a Green Mountain or if you're um, uh, Ben & Jerry's ice cream, you're sourcing some of the finest ingredients, whether it's coffee or cocoa or sugar or what have you. And, and you need quality, right, to be successful in your business. So the only way to get quality is to make sure the farmer gets a decent price. So now we have the, these aligned interests. Why is it so difficult to take those aligned interests where I, where I as a producer want to have predictable quality, um, I as a consumer certainly do not want to invest in deforestation. How difficult is it to, to take those aligned interests and actually operationally uh, yeah. put them into effect in a, in a way that your intent and my intent uh, is actually met? Right, that's a great question. And I think that is the, um, the heart of the fair trade model. Uh, aligning interests 
and helping companies source great tasting products that also help improve lives and protect the environment. Uh, helping farmers achieve a decent price for all their hard work so that they can keep their kids in school and put food on the table and, and gradually improve their living standards. And for you and me, for consumers, um, finding a way that we can make a difference in the world through our everyday shopping uh, decisions. So you know, break down your model for me. How, how do you okay. get there? Fair trade is um, uh, an international standard okay. for sustainable agriculture that uh, for the farmer means a rigorous 200 point checklist that they must comply with and that they're inspected and certified against every year. So we actually put inspectors on the ground all over the world. We're in 70 countries. We work with coffee farmers and sugarcane farmers, cocoa, rice, flowers, uh, fruits, vegetables, and so on. And so those farmers are agreeing uh, not to use child labor uh, to implement worker safety and health conditions, to pay above market wages, to conserve the environment. There's a whole series of standards around soil conservation, around water and forest conservation. So these farmers are some of the, the best stewards of the land and some of the most sustainable farmers in the world. They're certified as such. That gives them the ability to sell to any fair trade buyer in the world, Europe, Asia, uh, the United States. And fair trade buyers here in the U.S. Um, are agreeing to pay a price premium to help those farmers sustain that better model of agriculture. So it's a way for farmers to be more sustainable and to lead a better, uh, uh, to achieve a better livelihood. And it's a way for businesses to have that, in, in, uh, that reassurance through certification that they're sourcing from sustainable farms and that the money that they pay is getting back to those farms. Does that also have an effect on the price of the farmer's product? Well, farmers in the fair trade world get more money. That's the bottom line. And, you know, when I lived in Nicaragua in the 90s, I started Nicaragua's first fair trade co-op. I ran that co-op for four years. So through my own eyes, I saw the power of this model in the communities where we were working. We organized 3,000 families. Mm -hmm. They came together. These were coffee farmers. So they came together and processed their coffee as a group. We exported it as a group to the fair trade market in Europe at the time. And as a result, we were able to get a dollar a pound back to the farmers at a time when the local market was 10 cents a pound. That in turn allowed these farmers to keep their kids in school, to create scholarships for kids to go on to high school and to college. Uh, our farmers dug wells and brought clean drinking water into their villages for the first time. They built clinics. They paved the floor of dirt floor homes. They bought mules to bring the, the, the coffee down from the mountaintops on mule back rather than on their own backs. They reinvested in quality. They reinvested in organics. In short, it was this whole process of social, environmental, and economic development. And none of it was built on charity. It was all thanks to this direct market connection and the better price that farmers were getting back for their harvest. And what do the buyers get from, from paying more money? Instead of 10 cents a pound, they're, they're paying now a dollar. The, uh, the buyers, if you're referring to coffee companies, yeah. they were able to, um, uh, by going direct, to get that fair trade coffee for a very similar price to what they were getting it before, simply by jumping over the middlemen. Uh, typically, fair trade products hit your retail shelf at a very small price premium, maybe 5% more than a comparable quality product that isn't fair trade. And so if you're buying $10 Starbucks coffee, you might be paying 10, 50, or 11 bucks for a fair trade version of that. But what the, the research has shown and what market performance has shown is that conscious consumers, consumers that are looking for, for products that make a difference, are not deterred by a, a small price premium and in fact expect to see a small price premium in order to really believe in the legitimacy of the claim. You know, it's very similar to organics. What we do is, in that sense, similar to organics. It's a certification. Uh, there's a slight price premium, but you have this rapidly growing consumer segment that's really buying into the whole notion of better products that also make a difference in the world. How did you get into this particular area? So I studied economics and political science as an undergraduate in college, and I was particularly concerned about global mm -hmm. poverty and hunger. And, you know, like a lot of 22-year-olds, I decided that I wanted to do something about it and that the best thing that I could do would be to go overseas and volunteer. 
And so um, at the tender age of 22, I bought a one-way ticket to Nicaragua and went off to, uh, to help farmers. And for seven years, I worked on one development project after another that were funded by very well-intentioned agencies, uh, projects that were, de were developed by very well-intentioned uh, development professionals sitting in Paris and London and, and Washington, D.C. And those projects failed to help people on the ground develop their own capacity to solve their own problems. Those development projects, in my experience, more often than not, simply recreated dependency on foreign aid. And so I became very disaffected with the whole notion of development aid. And um, quite by accident in 1990, discovered these crazy people in Europe that called themselves fair traders and were, who were willing to pay a dramatically higher price for coffee and cocoa and sugar and other commodities if we could only organize small family farmers into co-ops and sell direct. Were the intermediaries at the time, were they families or were they small uh, corporations or how, how did those intermediaries function? Coffee buyers in most coffee producing countries are commercial traders. In Central America they're referred to as coyotes uh, because they essentially prey on um, small family farmers who don't have access to the market and who are essentially at the mercy of whoever drives up offering to buy their coffee on harvest day. So um, uh, often the, the, the middlemen are, or the coyotes are, are attached to transnational companies or their independent operators um, who are really taking advantage of the isolation of much of the, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the small farmers and their lack of knowledge about the market. If fair trade in its essence is all about direct market access for people who uh, otherwise would, would not be linked to the market and, and, and might even be victims of, of, of that um, yeah, lack of market access. Has this been enabled by um, the communication technologies, the internet and so on in, in any respect or is this really something that, that um, exists separate from some of the um, disintermediating technologies that have been developed over the last years? But I would say the core principle behind fair trade is not a technological innovation, it's the notion of economies of scale. It's very simple. Most fair trade farmers own two acres of land, maybe three, right? Half the world's coffee is produced by coffee farmers with less than 10 acres, okay? Half the world's coffee. Half the world's coffee. So that's who we work with. We work with small growers, the poorest of the poor. Mm -hmm. And if you only uh, own two acres of coffee, you're probably producing about one ton a year, about 2,000 pounds of coffee a year. It takes 40,000 pounds just to fill one container. So there's no way that as an individual grower you're going to become commercially viable in the world market. You have to band together with your neighbors. You know, in the great barn raising tradition of the American Midwest, right. or in the great co-op tradition of the United States where sun-kissed oranges and ocean spray cranberries are grower co-ops, so our farmers are coming together to process their coffee, their sugar, their cocoa as a group and, 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 and achieve those economies of scale and then export as a group. And you know, many of our co-ops have thousands and thousands of members, which means at that scale they can hire college educated managers, they can implement um, technological innovations around communications and around processing, they can achieve the best quality product possible and they can be viable with you know, any export company in the, mar in the market. Talk about your funding. If you're a market-based solution, um, how are you funded? Are you funded by the market itself yet, or are, are you dependent on, on uh, contributed revenue? So um, Fairtrade USA, the organization that I started in 98, is the leading certifier of Fairtrade products in the United States. And we also, in addition to certifying the products, uh, and labeling with this label. So when you go to the grocery store, if you see this label, fair trade certified on a package of coffee or a bunch of bananas, you know the farmer got a fair price, you know that it came from a sustainable farm. But in, in addition to that certification service that we provide to companies, uh, now over 800 companies in the US, we also uh, have farmer training programs and we also have consumer education programs. The certification portion of our business is uh, entirely self-funded through the service fees that our corporate partners pay us. So when I audit and certify Ben and Jerry's ice cream, they pay me for that service and for the right to use the fair trade label. That portion of my business is self-funded, even though we're a nonprofit organization. Uh, what is grant funded is the roughly 20, 25% of my total budget, which is dedicated to both farmer training and consumer awareness. Consumer awareness, we have a fantastic program called Fair Trade Towns. 
And we have another program called Fair Trade Universities. And these programs are aimed at helping people either on college campuses or in their communities to um, promote fair trade as a way for people to get involved. So not only do um, uh, fair trade towns activists kind of get the word out about fair trade, but they hold promotional events. Uh, they uh, do all kinds of uh, fun activities to call attention to fair trade and to give churches and student groups and, uh, and local community organizations a way to plug in and get involved in practical solutions to global poverty. Uh, that portion of our uh, work is funded through charitable donations. We also have farmer training because farmers, of course, uh, when they plug into fair trade and when they start to sell to you know, very demanding uh, U.S. companies, farmers need to be able to be um, serious professional business people, right? They need to be able to deliver on time and to deliver the right quality, and that inevitably um, speaks to an opportunity to increase farmer training and capacity building. So we have um, farmer uh, management training programs uh, in both Africa and Latin America. Uh, where farmers develop skills in financial management, in uh, internal organization, in product quality, and so on. And that makes them um, better equipped to be successful in the global, in the global market. So you are, in essence, becoming a, an extension on the one hand of the supply chain of, of producers of coffee in, in this particular case. You're, you're also becoming an extension of government entities uh, overseas who have an interest in their farmers being trained and uh, in upgrading skills. Yeah, I wouldn't say we're an extension uh, of those efforts. I, I would say we're an alternative to those efforts. And frankly, the reason why we've won so many awards for social entrepreneurship is we're taking a totally different approach to a classic problem, which is poverty and environmental destruction. We're saying the solution isn't government regulation. The solution isn't government well entities or you yeah. know big, the, the big structures. The solution is the market. You know, so many folks think that globalization is the problem. We actually see globalization as an opportunity to empower the poor uh, and to unleash the entrepreneurial energy of poor people all over the world so that they can bootstrap their way out of poverty. And what you are providing to those uh, people is what they need, which is a, a chance to earn an income. It's money. Exactly. And that, in turn, if, in our perspective, comes primarily from market access. You know, there's been a lot of focus over the last 20 years on access to capital. The whole micro-lending phenomenon has been um, uh, huge. And um, Mohammed Yunus winning the, the Nobel Prize for his work with Grameen Bank has really put micro-lending on the map and helped shine a, a bright light on the fact that poor people need uh, not our charity, but access to loans, to capital, in order to be able to um, uh, create subsistence living. Our belief is that access to capital may be sufficient for a subsistence living, but that if you combine with that access to markets, you can actually go beyond subsistence. You can actually achieve sustainable development. I'm very proud to report that over the last 10 years, we've been able to deliver over $220 million in additional market value back to those farming communities, over and above what they would have received otherwise if they had sold to the local market. And that, at the end of the day, is the best metric the, uh, for success that we have, the, what we would refer to as our social return on investment. That's what we aim to do. We aim to put more money back in the pockets of hardworking farming families so that they, in turn, can um, make that journey out of poverty. And you're doing it by going back to uh, wealth of nations capitalism. You're, doing, you're going back to Adam Smith where it's about access to markets, access to information, uh, removing uh, non-value adding uh, steps and players. Yeah. Um, it's, it's, it's very classic in terms of, of capital, capitalist theory. Yeah, yeah it is. Talk about the organization. What does the organization look like that is, that, that is driving this progress? We, um, this year, have a $10 million budget, so we're still a fairly small organization. Uh, about $7.5 million of that budget comes from earned revenue by virtue mm -hmm. of the certification uh, service and the supply chain conversion service that we offer to uh, now over 800 companies here in the United States, uh, whose fair trade sales last year were uh, a combined value of about $1.4 billion. Um, our, uh, the other portion of our budget, about $2.5 million a year, comes from charitable contributions um, 
both from individuals as well as from foundations. And that is aimed at consumer education and uh, at farmer capacity building. How many full-time employees do you have? How many part-time volunteers, trainers, and so on? Well, we have a, a full-time staff of about 55 people based here in Oakland, California. And uh, we have an army of volunteers all over the country. Um, we've been blessed to um, uh, have, um, over the last decade, the emergence of not only a fair trade market, but a fair trade movement. And so what we find is that there is a, a small but very vocal and passionate group of people out there that not only want to buy fair trade products, but they want to go out and evangelize for it. They want to spread the word. And so, you know, in communities across the country, people are hearing about fair trade for the first time at church or at school or um, uh, at their local uh, Rotary Club meeting. And so that network approach to spreading the word has really been uh, a very powerful driver of consumer awareness. We have 34% uh, awareness today of the fair trade label, and about half of the people who are aware of the label are buying fair trade products. Uh, our goal, obviously, is to take that awareness up to 80 or 90%. Uh, and if you look at Europe, where fair trade started, uh, Europe has been doing fair trade now for about 40 years, so they're way down the path. Uh, and an awareness of fair trade in Europe now is approaching 90% in most markets. Interestingly enough, market share in um, key commodities such as coffee and bananas is now approaching 50% in some European countries uh, as a result. So, for example, half of all the, f the bananas in Switzerland and the UK today are fair trade certified. So I think we might have guessed, you know, a decade ago that, sure, fair trade will work for the kind of funky uh, Berkeley crowd, right? <laughs> but uh, it'll never be mainstream, right? Because Americans are basically indifferent to the plight of third world farmers. Well, if Europe is any indication of our future, I would say that that, uh, that myth has been exploded. Because when half of all the bananas and a third of all the coffee in many European countries are now fair trade, I think that gives an indication that fair trade can and will be a mainstream phenomenon here in the United States as well. You know, we work with not only mission-driven companies, we work with Starbucks, we work with Dunkin' Donuts, uh, we work with Green Mountain Coffee Roasters, we work with um, Walmart and Safeway and Costco. So mainstream brands and retailers are increasingly stepping up and saying, yes, we too care about farmers, we too care about sustainable supply chains, and we want to give our consumers a choice. We want to give consumers a chance to vote with their dollars for these more sustainable products. Are you um, interested in expanding internationally in terms of having uh, your brand be recognized in other countries? Um, or are you more interested in, in retaining the brand recognition here in the United States and expanding in terms of markets? The big question for us of late has been, what about American farmers, right? What about the plight of farm workers in the American agricultural um, uh, situation? And this interest has come not only from social justice communities, uh, the interest has come not just from farm worker groups or from, from farmer associations here in the U.S. The interest has also come from the retailers that we work with, uh, be it Costco or Whole Foods um, or uh, Sam's Club or, uh, or Safeway. Uh, consistently asking, this is great that we can have um, a fair trade bananas, but why can't we have fair trade strawberries from Watsonville, California, right? I mean, what's uh, keeping us from certifying American farms and supporting sustainable agriculture on farms here in the U.S.? It's a great question. What can consumers do to advance fair trade? I think Americans care, but our, our, our challenge is how do we make a difference? How does little old me make a difference in this great big world of poverty and climate change, right? What can I do? And I think many people feel despair because we don't know what we can, we can do. We don't think our, our voice matters or we don't think our voice is heard. We don't have time to demonstrate or write letters to Congress. Hell, half the country doesn't even have time to vote, right? So what fair trade does is give us an easy, simple way to lift our voice and, and, and make it heard, right? If we can make a difference in the world through something as simple and easy as a daily cup of coffee or a banana, 
If we can, if we can through that cup of coffee, reach halfway across the world and help a farming family out of poverty, help that family keep their kids in school, that's a very powerful notion. And that notion has captivated the imagination of now millions and millions of Americans who are regularly buying fair trade products and in so doing, getting a great tasting product that also improves lives and protects the environment. And we have that effect simply by living our own lives. Absolutely. I mean, we all eat, right? So if you can choose this coffee versus that one, this banana versus that one, and by choosing the fair trade alternative, make a powerful difference around the world, doesn't that sound like a good deal? Increasingly, Americans are saying yes. And so you ask me, what can, what can people do to help? Look for fair trade products every time you go to the supermarket. Uh, ask for it, buy it, and spread the word. Well, Paul, thank you so much for sharing your insights with us. Thank you, thank you for founding this wonderful organization. And uh, thank you for joining us today. Thank you, Mark. It's been a pleasure.